Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Gene Fischel. First, I would like to say thank you for having this in Richmond and not Northern Virginia. Jake, that uh, thing we spoke at a couple weeks ago, it took me five hours to get home uh, from up there. And I left at 1230 in the afternoon from DC. So it's nice to come right down the street. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, to speak to you. Thank you for allowing me to come. Um, as Jake mentioned, I work in the Attorney General's office. And I head up our uh, computer crime section uh, in that office. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of an overview, sort of as to what we do. And I, I, I have a disclaimer on this talk. I'm a prosecutor. I'm an attorney and a prosecutor by trade. All of you guys are smarter than I am. I am not a techie. So uh, my talk and, and my perspective is going to come really from the law enforcement side. Uh, dealing with computer security issues and computer crime issues that we see on a daily basis and try and give you a little bit of perspective uh, as to what, uh, how law enforcement uh, views these issues, uh, the kind of tools we have out there. We're, we're uh, the, the AG's office and, and really all law enforcement uh, are a resource for you. Uh, and, and so that's one thing I want to make clear today, and, and I'll have my contact info uh, on this presentation at the end, but we're, we're a resource for you to help you out if, if you get in trouble, if something happens to you or your business, uh, or even just you as a citizen. Uh, you know, we're there, we're there to help you out. And so really the way the Attorney General's office is structured uh, is in, in Virginia, um, there are very few crimes that the Attorney General of Virginia can actually investigate and prosecute. Most of those crimes, the prosecution side, are left up to the local Commonwealth attorneys, your local uh, elected prosecutors. Um, however, about 13, 14 years ago, the General Assembly, in its infinite wisdom, uh, said, well, no, we're going to create a special uh, area where the Attorney General can investigate and prosecute, and, that, and one of those areas, uh, among a couple others, are computer crimes. So about 14 years ago, they created uh, a jurisdiction for us to travel around Virginia and investigate and prosecute all sorts of computer crimes. And so what my section, the computer crime section, uh, in the AG's office is comprised of our attorneys, pros attorneys slash prosecutors, and, and we travel around Virginia uh, and, and prosecute cases in both state and federal court. Um, and uh, the crimes that we have jurisdiction over are, Jake mentioned some of them, um, uh, anything under Virginia's Computer Crime Act, which is computer fraud, uh, computer trespass, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about these shortly. Computer trespass, computer invasion of privacy, email crimes like spamming uh, and phishing and that sort of thing. Um, uh, identity theft we prosecute uh, and we also prosecute uh, crimes under the child exploitation laws. So child pornography, online solicitation and uh, unfortunately we see uh, a, a lot of those crimes uh, come across our desk. Um, we work with all sorts of law enforcement. We work with Secret Service, FBI. We work with all the federal, because we're cross-designated uh, as federal prosecutors. We work with state police. We work with local law enforcement. Uh, and so we're hooked in to all sorts of law enforcement across the state, which is why I think we're a good resource for uh, citizens and businesses who have been in trouble. We work uh, across lines uh, in our enforcement of the law. So we have jurisdiction to go around the state and prosecute those kinds of things. We also have a computer forensic unit within my section where we actually take on digital evidence that's seized from crime scenes. Um, and we uh, right now have three computer forensic examiners and you know we bring that back and, and have a forensic lab in the Attorney General's office where we forensically uh, analyze that material uh, for investigations. and. As a prosecutor that's uh, you know, working a lot of our cases, if I can have my forensic examiner in-house, it's very helpful to me because, uh, as you all probably know, computer forensics can be rather complex. And that's one reason we exist anyway is because uh, a lot of local law enforcement, a lot of local prosecutors, 
don't necessarily have the expertise to deal uh, with computer evidence, which is, which is the big hurdle in doing any of these sorts of prosecutions uh, around the state. So uh, that, that's a little bit of an overview of what, we got, what we're going to do. What, I, what I'm going to do today is I'm, I'm going to focus on a couple areas that I think uh, might impact you guys. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the law that's out there. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about database breach uh, incidents, uh, which are now a, a very common occurrence, and it's something that we have jurisdiction over. Uh, part of what we do is, uh, as many of you know, there are now database breach notification laws uh, in almost every state across the country. So if you're holding personal information that gets breached, you have to notify our office and you also have to notify the affected consumers in, in a lot of circumstances. So I'm going to talk uh, a, a little bit about database breach notification, uh, what we look for from an enforcement perspective, you know, what our view is when we get these notices from, from you or your companies uh, that you've been breached. I'm going to talk about some of the requirements of this law. Um, and uh, I'm also going to pinpoint some other laws that are related to data breaches, and, and not just data breaches, but computer security incidents uh, around Virginia, uh, and, and, and show you some of the, the uh, remedies that are available should you or your business ever be hacked, or you as a citizen uh, ever, ever find yourself in trouble. Um, uh, I'll show you some of the laws that recover, or that, that cover those sorts of crimes. So. First, I, I got to say, as you can imagine, with, with the types of crimes that uh, we investigate uh, in, in the computer crime section, we get, we get a lot of criminals, a lot of defendants uh, who, let's just say, spend a lot of time at home. They don't really get out much. Uh, and, and so we end up prosecuting guys who live in places that look like this. Um, these are, this is a real photo, real photo from one of my cases. As those of you who can't tell, this is a, uh, and, and I apologize for this screen, and, and I know Jake's working on it, the blips and stuff, we're having some technical issues. Uh, for those who can't tell, and, and I'm sorry if I'm blocking anyone, anyone's view, but this is actually a bedroom. So when my, my agents kicked in the door one day, this guy was actually living in this room. That's a bed right there, and he was, he was actually sleeping here. Uh, and, to, you know, to be quite frank, uh, I could show you <laughs> a lot worse pictures um, uh, than this that, that we've kicked in, but that probably aren't appropriate to show. But I do want to show you this picture uh, of a bathroom in another house, which I thought was kind of funny. Notice the recliner <laughs> in the bathtub. Um, that's a uh, pretty interesting <laughs> setup they had going there. Uh, it's really interesting when uh, I'm not necessarily on uh, all of the, when we kick in the door on a lot of these guys who are, you know, whether it's hacking or identity theft. Um, uh, I'm not on all these, but my, you know, my officers, my agents come back and like to show me the pictures. These are all from, these are from real cases we prosecuted. These guys were convicted of various crimes, whether it's identity theft or child exploitation. There's also a pile of trash down here. Uh, I don't really know, want to know what that is. Um, uh, then there was this house where they went in. Um, and if you notice, there were water damage and holes to the ceiling. And there's a cat in the ceiling there walking through, peering down through a hole in the ceiling. Um, there wasn't just one cat. This guy had 12 cats. And most of them were up in the ceiling. <laughs> Uh, roaming around. Um, so that, that, that was a surprise and fortunately the officer took this picture right at the moment when the, when the, cat, was, uh, well, when the cat was smiling. So I thought y'all might uh, uh, appreciate this anecdote. Here are a couple of the guys <laughs> that, that we busted. This guy um, looks really happy to have been arrested uh, apparently. So these, these guys actually lived uh, in uh, these kinds of houses. Now, this guy, um, this guy did not, uh, this guy right here, I'm sorry for those who can't see, this guy uh, did not live uh, in, in squalor like a surprising amount of our defendants uh, live in. This guy 
uh, we prosecuted several years ago. This guy was actually one of the top spammers in the world. Uh, his name was Jeremy Janes. Um, and he was, uh, I, think, I think, the eighth biggest spammer in the world. And uh, I, I happened to be on the prosecution team that prosecuted this guy. Um, this guy uh, was making millions and millions of dollars sending spam. Now, you got to remember, this was, this was 10 years ago. So really, in tech world, this is ancient times. Uh, and, and, and it really was. But what this, this was significant because it was the first... Um, it was the first prosecution for spamming in the United States, uh, felony spamming. And this guy was defrauding people out of thousands of dollars and sending out, you know, pumping AOL, tons of spam through AOL servers. As many of you might imagine, because we have Northern Virginia uh, and AOL and we used to have MCI and all the ISPs that are up there, we actually get a lot of jurisdiction uh, on the criminal side to prosecute crimes because we have a lot of stuff running through the servers in Northern Virginia, and that's how we gain jurisdiction in this case. This guy, Jeremy Janes, uh, was a prolific spammer residing outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, and we ultimately found him. He had a team of people who were helping him do this, um, and, and so we, um, we were able to you know, find out where he was, kick in his door. This was actually at 6 in the morning, this picture. Uh, when we busted in. He was living uh, in a house. Uh, well, this house, I'll, I'll say this. This was a very nice house in a nice suburb of Raleigh. This is where he was doing his spamming operation. Okay, he bought this house to solely spam. Now, obviously times have changed because what this guy was doing was he was falsifying header information. He was using a, a script program to change domain names to avoid AOL's filters, basically, uh, and, and send his, you know, 10 million emails a day through AOL's systems. Whereas, you know, since this time, uh, nine or 10 years ago, what spammers there are out there are using botnets and zombie networks and all, all this other stuff um, and, and uh, to, to engage in this. But back then, this guy was, was, um, had a stolen database of AOL emails uh, that he was targeting, was sending out, uh, he was peddling um, penny stocks and, and mortgage, some mortgage schemes and sending it out. He bought this house just to spam. Um, and, it, it, and so he had his system set up there, and when we kicked in the door uh, that day, there was virtually no furniture in there, uh, just, um, just computer equipment and his spamming operation. This guy... Uh, they, and they happened to be at the house when we kicked in. This guy was, um, uh, just to show you the difference between the, the cases I just showed you and this, this guy had about 12 cases of Dom Perignon champagne that they were drinking and 12 cases of champagne glasses. And they would drink out of the champagne glass, and when they were done, they'd throw the glass away. I mean, that's, and, and they would just drink out of one glass, get another glass, throw it, they weren't washing their glasses. So they, this was all laid out when we got in there. Uh, th this guy made a lot of money, and actually, this is where the guy actually lived, uh, was this house in Raleigh. Um, so quite, quite a different um, scenario than, than a lot of our guys. This guy was obviously, at that time, very sophisticated with what he was doing. And in his house, uh, up there in the corner, uh, when we got in the attic, he had this. He had two T1 lines. Uh, coming out of his attic to pump that spam. I mean, the Attorney General's office back then had one T1 line for hundreds of people. This guy was paying some tremendous phone bills, <laughs> was buying C blocks of IP addresses and, and using them. But this, is, but this was the operation he had coming out of his attic. So um, pretty interesting stuff and, and also interesting in that uh, you know, nowadays when we're prosecuting these crimes, um, it, it's not going to be very often where we see uh, setups like this or methods like this spammer um, because technology is ever changing and frankly it takes a long time for the law. And, and, and law enforcement tries to keep up. Criminals, though, are always one step ahead because they don't have to abide by laws. They can, um, they, they can work outside the law. And so. Uh, we, we, we try and we've tried in Virginia to pass laws 
uh, that, that keep up with the times, but inevitably there are new techniques, there are new types of crimes with every new technology that's invented um, and, and new types of crimes that are um, uh, perpetrated by these criminals. So that, folks, concludes the most interesting part of my talk this morning. <laughs> so I, I hope everyone doesn't go to sleep after that. But um, what I want to talk about uh, first, I'm going to focus on uh, database breaches and, and what we're seeing on, on our side, on the law enforcement side. I'm going to touch on some identity theft, which is closely related to database breaches. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the computer crimes uh, that are here in uh, Virginia and some of the conduct that's covered by them and, and what we see. So as many of you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Every year, Verizon has, uh, for the last several years, put out a very good uh, data breach investigation report every year um, where they um, uh, you know, collect a lot of information over the course to analyze you know, where data breaches are occurring, um, what kinds of database breaches are occurring, and they, and they draw this from uh, law enforcement, you know, you can see Secret Service, Homeland Security, uh, law, all sorts of law enforcement investigations um, uh, contribute to this, major computer security companies, major uh, computer security organizations, and ISPs uh, help to put this information together. And frankly, it's been a very useful tool for law enforcement to see. Uh, law, it's certainly law enforcement that's much bigger than, than my office, such as FBI and Secret Service, where they can concentrate their efforts uh, in combating uh, data breaches. So uh, this was their report uh, that they released this year. They had 50 contributing global organizations. And, and I just put this up as illustrative uh, uh, for all of you to see kind of where the trends are, are, are coming from uh, regarding database breaches. Uh, 1,367 confirmed data breaches, 63,437 security incidents, not necessarily data breaches. Uh, and this was over 95 countries uh, represented. Um, and so uh, we can see here uh, uh, on this chart that uh, the most prevalent method for data breaches uh, in 2013 uh, were web app attacks. Uh, that, that was number one uh, that Verizon targeted. Number two was uh, forms of cyber espionage, um, you know, trying to gain, you know, whether it's trade secrets or intellectual property, that sort of thing. Uh, and then uh, the third, as you can see at the top, and this is the, I'm looking at the left-hand column, and I apologize if I'm blocking some folks' view. Um, uh, the third biggest were point-of-sale uh, intrusions. Um, one of the biggest last year uh, being Target um, was, was a major data breach uh, where there was some point of sale uh, intrusion. And, and then it breaks it down from there. Um, these are the top uh, categories. So card skimmers you'll see at 9%, insider misuse, which personally uh, in our office, I'm going to show you our, some of our stats here in a second, but insider misuse seems to be a major problem with database breaches, okay? Uh, it, it, it seems like there is a, and, and maybe even more so represented uh, than, than here on a, on a global scale, uh, that there, there's a lot of lost laptops and there are a lot of crooked folks working inside companies uh, who have access to this material. And, you know, the, at the end of the day, you can have all the security you want uh, on your computer, you can, you can have it all, but if you have someone on the inside who's doing it, you know, what are you going to do about that? I mean, you can have all the, the, the security, but if someone turns in your organization uh, and accesses this personal information and sends it out, there's frankly, I don't know how much there is you can do about it. Um, and that's what we see a lot uh, coming across uh, our desk. In 2013, now Virginia is a, is a mid-sized state in the country we received 271 database breach notices. And as far as work days, that we're receiving them almost on a daily basis uh, in our office. And these database breaches uh, that we've received in Virginia represent a broad cross-section of industry. They represent colleges and universities. They represent online sales folks. They, they, they represent 
um, uh, retailers, brick and mortar retailers. Um, they represent major companies uh, and they represent really small companies. Uh, and in fact, I would say that the majority of database breaches that we've received, uh, easily the majority are very small companies and the breaches are not very large. Um, they, they only uh, affect you know, one person, one Virginia resident, two Virginia residents, something like that. Not, not the millions or hundreds of thousands that you will see in the news, most prominent. And those are, those are serious too, I'm not, it, it, it's all serious. Uh, but my, my point is, uh, and, and someone asked me this uh, at, a, at a talk I gave a couple weeks ago on, on, or a panel I was on on database breaches, someone asked, you know, does it really matter? I mean, this, this stuff is happening so much. Do these notices that are sent to consumers, do they really matter? Are consumers really paying attention to them? Um, well, I would say yes, they do. Um, and for a couple reasons. One, I know firsthand because we get a lot of citizens who receive these notices and call up our office freaked out because they received the database breach notice. But secondly, a lot of these breaches are very personal in nature. And, and what I mean by that is, as I mentioned, there are only one or two people who are affected in a lot of these breaches. Um, and it, and it's, not the, it's not the hundreds of thousands of affected citizens, you know, getting swept up. It's the one person who's all their financial account information, including their social security number, um, was, you know, on the laptop that was left in the employee's car that was stolen from their car. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. And if a criminal gets their hands on a laptop, uh, and has access to one person's account information, that one person is, is at a greater risk of, of, of being a victim of identity theft or fraud than the person who is swept up in 30 million credit cards uh, or financial account information uh, that's been swept up in, say, a Target breach or a LexisNexis breach or, you know, one of the major breaches that we've heard about in the last few years. So uh, this... These database breaches are, are very personal to a lot of people, uh, and, and I think the notices certainly have helped. Um, uh, but, you know, in a large scale, the smaller breaches have dominated uh, the landscape that we've seen. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we, get a, we get a broad range of victims who have become database breach uh, uh, victims. Uh, and, and so my, one of the messages I, wa I want to get out uh, to, to this group, to your group, is that, uh, you know, if you run a business or an organization and you happen to be breached, and, and, and frankly, each state takes a different approach to this. Um, from our perspective, our goal in, the, in receiving these notices and in dealing with database breaches is to make sure that the consumer or the citizen whose information has been compromised is notified. That's, that's what we want. We, our, our goal is not to punish companies for having database breaches. Our primary goal is to make sure that in, in, as fast as possible that, um, that the citizen or resident who's been affected is notified of the breach so they can take whatever steps to protect themselves uh, and, and, the, and their financial information. I'm gonna talk about here in a second what these requirements are as far as notices go um, and, and when to provide notice and, and, and that sort of thing. But that, 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 is, our, that is our goal. We, we do not automatically take an adversarial posture to database breaches uh, in our office. We're, we're there to work with you and the companies uh, that we receive notices from that may be deficient in some way, we call them up and work with them to correct it and get the notice out. Um, and and that's, that's what our goal is. Uh, our, our, our goal is not to be adversarial. And so if you ever have a question uh, about, you know, whether you should submit a breach or a question about the breach or an incident, you, you should not hesitate to contact us or, you know, make sure you talk, if you have attorneys who are working on this, work with your attorney, contact our office to make sure 
um, th that you're complying. So a little bit of an overview about Virginia's database breach law. Uh, as I mentioned, almost every state has a database breach law. I think there are 47 now. There's still apparently two or three uh, that do not have database breach law, but, but every, every state has one. Ours was passed in 2008, and it was passed with a, um, a, a collaboration, a working group between business and law enforcement and consumer groups and that sort of thing to, to create a, a fair law for when you must notify um, uh, if, if you've been breached. And, and frankly, ours is a fairly standard provision. There are more stringent standards across the country, and, and they're less stringent. Ours, ours is fairly average. And fr you know, frankly, when we get database breach notices into our office, at, at this point, you know, six, seven years into this, when these notices had started being required, most companies, if certainly if it's a larger scale company, most companies, they follow the most stringent uh, standard uh, for, for notices. And so naturally, it's going to comply uh, with Virginia's standard uh, if they're following the most strict. But, you know, when does a database breach notice apply? Well, uh, the, the statute basically says it applies to any legal entity. It's a, it's a very broad application. It, 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 so basically, if you're an organization, a company, a, a, a county, I, I, even government has to do this. Uh, and we've had some massive government breaches. Uh, even in here in Virginia, the Department of Health was breached uh, several years ago, thousands and thousands of their records, and they had to send notice. But uh, if you are a legal entity and you're holding this information um, and, and you've experienced a breach, and I'll, I'll tell you what a breach is here in a second, then you need to provide notice. Uh, the data we're talking about, uh, if, if it's unencrypted data, okay, and is accessed or acquired, acquired by, by an unauthorized person, that's going to trigger your notice. And it must have caused or reasonably believe will cause fraud or identity theft to a resident. Uh, and then, if that's the case, you must notify the, our office, the Attorney General's office, and the affected residents without unreasonable delay. Now, uh, what is reasonably believe to have caused fraud or identity, or may cause fraud or identity theft? There is no definition. Uh, of reasonably believed. Um, so in the ultimate sense, um, that there, and this is why really you should talk to our office and also talk to your attorneys. In, in the ultimate sense, reasonably believe is going to be decided if this ever was litigated. Uh, it's going to be decided by a judge and, and the prosecutor as to what is reasonably, you know, reasonable as far as ha may cause identity theft or fraud. It is very difficult to stand up here and give a million different hypothetical fact situations. You have to use your common sense. Um, so, for example, if a laptop is stolen, uh, there is no encryption on personal information on that, uh, if so, or if someone hacks into the database and pulls the information out, um, it's reasonable to think that that information is going to be misused in some way to commit, to commit identity theft. Um, there, there are lots of scenarios where it may not be reasonable to think that, uh, but my point, it, it, my point is you have to assess your, the fact situation of the breach. Uh, talk with our office, uh, and talk with your attorney to make sure um, that you're complying with the statute and that the notice requirements triggered. Now, you have to notify us without unreasonable delay. That's also not defined. Some states have uh, attorney general's offices, attorneys general offices have, um, have created bright line rules as to when you have to send out the, the notice. So, for example, I think Indiana says you have 30 days, okay, you have 30 days after you discover the breach to send out the notice, all right? Our office doesn't have such a bright line rule. What we are looking for is when you discover the breach, you need to be making a good faith effort to assess the situation immediately and then begin the process of notifying the consumers. 
Now, there are all sorts of ways to notify. I'm going to talk about some more requirements. But uh, the, the short of it is, if you find out about the breach, you can't sit on the information. You have, you have to start going. And different breaches are different scales. Some take more time to assess than others. So setting a bright line rule, I, I don't know how effective necessarily that is. There are exceptions in the statute uh, for delay. One of them, the, the, the biggest, uh, and most prominent is law enforcement delay. So uh, you're talking about the actual breach itself, uh, investigating what happened. Um, and, and I recommend if there has been a breach incident, you need to contact law enforcement as soon as you can. Uh, and a, a lot of times the law enforcement agency investigate, and that includes our office. If you're a Virginia company, you can contact our office on the breach itself, the actual computer security incident. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times law enforcement does not want the company uh, notifying the consumers and putting out the information as to what happened so that they can conduct their investigation uh, in an effective manner. And so law enforcement delay is acceptable if you can show that you've contacted law enforcement and working with law enforcement. Uh, also, there, notice is required for encrypted data if you believe the person has access to the key. Okay, so if it's just encrypted data and, and it's just and it's encrypted uh, and, and that's it and you don't think they can get into it, then the notice requirement doesn't apply. But if it is encrypted and you also think they might be able to, you know, decrypt it, then uh, you do have to provide notice. Um, if there are more than a thousand people who have been affected by the breach, you also not only have to notify our office and the citizens, you have to notify the consumer reporting agencies of the breach. So what is data? Well, data is basically personal information, uh, and it's limited to, you know, what kind of data are we talking about? Social security number, financial account or credit card numbers, along with the access code, and a driver's license number. That's what qualifies as data in Virginia statute. Some states are a lot broader than this. I'll show you the identity theft uh, provisions here in a second where it is every personal piece of information imaginable that qualifies if someone mit takes your information and uses it um, uh, to commit identity theft that qualifies. But, but database breaches, it's social security number, it's financial and account information. Uh, it's your driver's license number or it's uh, credit card numbers with um, the access code. And notice, what is notice? Most of the time, our notice uh, that the companies send out are letters to the consumer or the affected individual. They're letters to our office. Uh, it can also be email uh, or it could be telephone. You can, you can call or it could be substitute notice. So in massive breaches such as Target, you know, where you have millions of people, um, and most states allow for this, in Virginia we certainly do. Um, if it's over 100,000 folks whose data breach uh, or whose data was compromised, if it's over 100,000, you can post what's called substitute notice, and that's just posting it conspicuously on your website or notifying statewide media of the incident. That's gonna satisfy the notice requirement. Obviously, it'd be a huge burden if a million Virginians information was stolen and you had to send out letters to a million people. So notice, uh, what does notice include? It must include the incident in general terms, type of information accessed, um, so specifically what was in the data set that was taken, uh, the general acts, what you're gonna do basically to prevent further unauthorized access to prevent this from happening again. Uh, it, it must provide a telephone number uh, for affected persons to call, and also advice directing people to remain vigilant of their accounts and monitor free credit reports. Most, uh, most of the companies that we get, they actually provide free credit monitoring for the person affected. Um, and that's not required in Virginia. In some states, it is required, uh, and, and these are more national companies that uh, actually provide credit monitoring, which I think is good, for affected citizens for like a year uh, or, or that sort of thing. So that's generally what is required from our database breach uh, not notification laws. And uh, if you fail to comply with these laws, 
our office can bring suit uh, against a company who fails to comply it, it, for up to 150,000 for each breach incident. Um, I, I will say that since this law has come about, we have not filed any suits because wherever, uh, we've, and we've been fortunate, wherever um, there was de a deficiency with a company failing to provide adequate notice, they've corrected it immediately. Um, but also remember that not only uh, it, it does it allow for our office to bring suit, the individual can bring suit. So the affected citizen uh, or person whose data uh, was compromised can also bring suit against the company uh, uh, for, you know, for what it, whatever reason, uh, if, if they were not provide, uh, provided adequate notice. So, um, and, and, and again, we, we, we are looking to work with you. Um, you know, I can generally say that red flags are gonna be raised if a company finds out about a data breach doesn't report it to law enforcement, there's no law enforcement exception, sits on the data for six months, is scared to, to say something because it's gonna look bad to them, it's gonna look, you know, create bad press or whatever. It sits on it for months, you know, six months or more, or, or a year or more, and then, you know, something happens where this, note, this breach was found out or they decide to notify at a later time. That's gonna raise a red flag, waiting months and months. And, and for no good reason. As I mentioned, there needs to be a good faith effort to address the problem and remedy the situation. So related to data uh, breaches, uh, of course, is identity theft. And that's really one of the big reasons why these database breaches uh, laws exist, is because of the resulting identity theft uh, that has occurred. Um, for example, uh, one day I, uh, opened up my credit card statement and uh, found a charge of $2,500 of coach purses uh, on my credit card statement. So I called my wife <laughs> and uh, was like, honey, <laughs> why are there $2,500 worth of coach purses? And she, of course, was like, I didn't buy coach purses and uh, thus are uh, we found out later, this was several years ago, our, our credit card was compromised um, and someone in Cleveland, Ohio had bought $2,500 worth of coach purses. So uh, it happens to everyone and frankly, uh, it, it, it's pretty hard to avoid being at risk to identity theft. And each year, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, they developed a program where they put out uh, with this uh, uh, consumer sentinel network, they kind of developed this network to uh, be a data clearinghouse for identity theft information and put out some stats uh, related to identity theft trends each year. So this is uh, the report from last year. Some of you may have seen this before. It's, this is also a very good report that we like to use and, and look at to see where where the trends of identity theft are. Um, but you can see on this chart that since 2001, around the time they started keeping these numbers, the number of uh, complaints of identity theft and fraud, this includes both fraud and identity theft uh, in this report, has, as you can see, dramatically uh, increased. Uh, last year they had 2,101,780 reports. Now there is naturally a deficiency in this reporting, okay, because it's all based on actual reported complaints of identity theft. They estimate, um, I think DOJ estimates that some, somewhere like 60% of people who have been victims of fraud or identity theft don't report it. Um, and and, and that, that's a huge number. And you could probably see why that's the case Maybe they don't want to bother. Maybe the, the loss is, you know, $20, $25. Uh, also, a lot of credit card companies now take most of them. Actually, if you report that there's a fraudulent purchase, they take it. Uh, they remove the charge from, um, from your credit, you know, from your uh, uh, account. Um, so there, a lot of people don't report this. Uh, but... This is based on reports, and, and there's pro it's probably a, a decent cross-section 
uh, on a smaller scale of, of, of the bigger picture of identity theft and fraud. And you see in Virginia, uh, these, these arrows here, Virginia ranks pretty high in fraud and identity theft. In fraud, they were number 11 in the country, and in identity theft, they were 16. Um, so easily in the top half, um, and in fact, the Northern Virginia, Washington, Washington D.C. and Northern Virginia were number two. That when they looked at metro metropolitan areas, Washington D.C. and Northern Virginia were number two in the country for uh, fraud and identity theft. So, um, and for a, you know a lot of a high population area, a lot of government workers. You'll see government document fraud is is a big. Uh, area of fraud, but anyway, so we, we have our share of um, identity theft and fraud in this state. And in Virginia, uh, the FTC even breaks it down by state. The, the top uh, area of fraud, uh, fraud and other complaint categories reported by Virginia consumers, the, the number one was banks and lender fraud. Um, so people trying to get loans, you know, fraudulently, uh, debt collection uh, was a, a major point of fraud, you know, sending notices through the mail, just fake notices to consumers saying, hey, you owe us money, send us money, that sort of thing. And then it goes down from there. Uh, credit cards actually was number 10 on that. Um, that's, that's just fraud, not specifically uh, I identity theft. Um, and, and fraud, the difference being fraud, you can you know, people trying to get fake loans and stuff are, are just making up names or in social security numbers as opposed to targeting someone and using their identity to do this. And so on the identity theft side in Virginia, the number one area was government documents or benefits fraud, you know, benefits, you know, insure, you know, social security, fake driver's licenses, that sort of thing was number one. And it was, it made up 29% of Virginia complaints in identity theft. Phone or utilities fraud, you know, phone accounts, um, you know, creating fake phone accounts. Of course, credit card fraud, like I just mentioned, is, is obviously fairly big. And then it goes down from there, bank fraud, loan fraud. So um, this kind of highlights the, the different areas uh, in, uh, on the Virginia side over the last year where um, these types of crime have occurred. Now, in Virginia, there are identity theft we have identity theft laws where it's unlawful to obtain, record, or access identifying information. You don't even have to misuse the information and try and get the loan. It is illegal to obtain it and access identifying information which is not available to the general public um, without authorization. So even just accessing this information, Okay, so for example, the data breach, the, the guy committing the data breach, getting access to this information, he's basically already committed identity theft, whether he goes and uses it or not. And of course, then using the information, um, you know, to obtain money, loans, that sort of thing uh, is, is illegal. What kinds of information? When we're talking about identity theft, it's much broader than data breaches. It's basically anything you can think of related to your person even just passwords, it just generally says passwords, um, is identity theft. All the things you, other things you think of, social security number, driver's license number, name, date of birth, all of these, if, if stolen and, and misused, um, uh, account for identity theft, it even includes fingerprints and biometric data. Okay, so it's, it's a very broad statute we have in Virginia with penalties of up to 12 months, and if the loss is greater than 200, it's one to five years imprisonment. If so, in, in the data breach example, if someone's getting 50 uh, persons uh, identifying information, it's one to five years uh, in, in prison also, or one to 10 years if the info is used to commit another crime. Now in our office, and this is just information for you as a citizen, uh, but also to, to pass along to your employees, we have resources in our office for identity theft. And I'm gonna give you our website here in a second. Or you can go on our website and, and we have a guide to victims of identity theft. It also has um, tips for prevention of identity theft. Should you find yourself compromised in a data breach or know someone who's compromised in a data breach, we have information uh, that, that allows you to, to help address 
these issues um, and, and account for what's happened. We also have what's called an identity theft passport. This came about, we were the first state uh, in the country to develop this. Now almost every state has one of these. So what happened several years ago, so there, there are two high profile incidents of people who um, their information was, was stolen and used by another criminal or a criminal to, uh, you know, create, to commit financial fraud. So this criminal is doing it in victim, a, victim A's name. Um, victim A was arrested. Um, there's a high profile incident of a man arrested at Dulles before he's about to board a plane and taken off in handcuffs and it turned out he was actually the victim of someone using his name and information to commit identity theft. So what we, what we developed was this identity theft passport, whereas if you filed a police report or you have an expungement order from a court that you've been a, a victim of identity theft, you can, you can obtain a passport, you go through a process and we have applications on our website to get this passport um, that you can note it, that you can show to law enforcement. It's not a get out of jail free card, but but basically what it is is um, you can show proof that you've been a victim of identity theft. You can show it to credit reporting agencies, law enforcement, that sort of thing, uh, and it allows law and it's now cross checked with D the DMV database where they can now go back and check and make sure that they have the right person uh, that they're that they're targeting. Um, so we have this as a resource for identity theft victims. Now, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm almost out of time here, but uh, the Virginia Computer Crimes Act covers a lot of areas, um, not just related to data breaches, as I focused on, but really uh, com any computer security incidents uh, that, that you can think of. One of the problems, uh, and, and this is why we work with so many organizations. We're, we're a state law enforcement agency, okay? With most computer incidents uh, that we're seeing, uh, right at about half or a little over, where do you think the criminals are? They're overseas, right? They're, they're sitting in Eastern Europe, they're in China, they're, they're wherever. Now, as a state, my, my little subpoena from the Commonwealth of Virginia isn't gonna have much effect in the Ukraine, you know, or Romania, or, or wherever. So, um, there, 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 there are a lot of issues with um, uh, investigating and prosecuting a lot of these incidents just because we, our organization, can't get to the person. Now, the feds can, um, and, and if it's big enough, you know, Secret Service, FBI, they, they investigate these things overseas and work with company, uh, work with co the governments of countries. Some countries, not, are, aren't like China, aren't as uh, successful in working with, but we work with um, Secret Service, FBI, to report these things to them uh, when, when there are major incidents um, so that they can do uh, whatever they want to do uh, in, in investigating it. It's not the case all the time. We, we certainly have our share of perpetrators in Virginia who are doing this. Uh, and if it's all within the United States, we work with other states, even as state law enforcement, even if the feds aren't involved, we can work with other states. Uh, to investigate this sorts of crime. It, happen, it happens all the time. But we do have laws on the books um, that, that deal with many sorts of incidents. Some aren't as strong as the federal laws on computer security, uh, but you can see computer fraud, spam, computer trespass, computer invasion of privacy, which is basically examining someone's financial info, theft of computer services, just stealing internet service is a crime uh, in Virginia. Uh, harassment by computer, we get this a lot from people harassing each other on Facebook. I won't get into that. Um, it, it's a lot of times someone's ex-girlfriend involved, or a boyfriend, not, not just girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, boyfriend. <laughs> uh, you know, there's some sort of harassment going on. Um, and we also just passed a, for those who don't know, a revenge porn bill uh, in the state that, how many people have heard of revenge porn? Yeah. Uh, we, we, there's now, starting July 1st, in less than a month, that's now a crime in Virginia to, um, uh, so the scenario is girlfriend, boyfriend, they record some sort of sex act or, or you know, 
film each other nude and then they break up and he goes and posts it somewhere on the internet. Uh, well, if you do that without their permission now, that's a crime uh, in Virginia. Uh, but we have a harassment by computer statute. We have a phishing statute and a civil provision. The computer trespass statute is what deals with uh, most, a lot of the hacking computer intrusion incidents uh, in Virginia. And it's basically every, you know, it, it tries to encompass everything you can think of, remove, halt, disable computer data program, cause a network to malfunction no matter the period of time alter, disable, erase computer data, those sorts of things are computer trespass. Um, so it's unlawful to do that with malicious intent, meaning that you um, are, are doing it to damage the person, uh, you know, with, with, as the law says, with an evil motive, that sort of thing uh, is computer trespass. It's up to 12 months in jail. Uh, you know, if you're talking about installing software on more than five computers or installing keystroke loggers, it's a higher penalty, one to five years, or if the damage is over $1,000. Computer fraud, uh, we, we see this a lot, like, you know, on eBay, someone selling something that's not real. We've prosecuted several of these. Uh, so either the what they're selling doesn't exist or it's, you know, not what they purport to be. Um, so computer fraud is a crime in Virginia, obtaining property or services by false pretenses, that sort of thing. Phishing, we were one of the first states, um, although I will say we have, we have never prosecuted a phishing case, not, not because we, we couldn't. One, one, of the, one of the issues we have in, in law enforcement is we only have but so many resources. And, and that spamming case I mentioned earlier that we prosecuted, that took a lot of resources from our office and investigators to investigate and prosecute that. Now, some cases are easier than others. Uh, a, a, a lot of phishing cases, one, again, the guy's overseas, okay, or girl is overseas, and it, it's hard to get to them. But also, you know, it takes a lot of work, and we have to work with internet service providers and companies to, to gather the evidence and the information to prosecute this. But we, we have phishing uh, crimes in Virginia, which of course phishing, I'm sure all of you know, it's using trickery, you know, a lot of times over email, you know, purporting to be your bank or a bank and say, hey, send us your account information, your account's out of date, that sort of thing uh, is phishing. Uh, and finally, there is a civil remedy um, that any individual wronged by any of those crimes I listed. So you, you and your company, you, you have uh, redress under this statute if you're hacked. If it doesn't rise to a criminal level, as I mentioned, malicious intent, that standard doesn't apply on the civil side. So malicious intent's a fairly high burden for a prosecutor on the criminal side, but on the civil side, if any of this conduct happens, uh, you have a provision to, um, to uh, sue the, the, the person who's done this, um, assuming you can find them. Um, uh, but there, there is a provision in the statute, and, and again, it's um, a malicious intent is not required, and you can get loss of profits, whatever damage has been caused. So uh, that remedy is available to you. However, does, everyone knows the old saying, you can't squeeze blood out of a you know, blood out of a turnip, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, chances are if you sue one of these guys, they're going to be living in a house like this. <laughs> so, and this is another real case where they vacuumed the pathway to their front door uh, up there. So, um, anyway, uh, that pretty much concludes my remarks. Um, uh, this is our website. Uh, for the Attorney General's office. Uh, you can see it down here, and it, it's in the materials, I'm sure. Uh, if you ever have any problems, ever have any questions, or need uh, any help, please do not hesitate uh, to contact our office. We're, we're there for you. Um, uh, we're, we're there to help you out if we can. Uh, so, so please don't hesitate to contact us. And uh, unfortunately, I think I'm out of time. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to come up to me. Uh, and, and ask them after this. But uh, thank you very much and enjoy the conference. So.